Welcome to Responsible Chicken Breeding. My name's Karen, and this is Jim, and he's excited. <laughs> well, he's I am. Excited. Yeah. I am excited. I will tell you, part of the excitement is I'm in my uh, air-conditioned office. It's, it is very warm in southern West Virginia, and it's very humid. Yeah. Very humid, but probably not much different where you're at. <laughs> that sounds like summer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. We're in July. We've yep. never done an episode in July, so this will be fun. I'm sure it'll be way different than in June. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing, Karen? All right. Same as Good. you. Hot, busy. Kennel's busy. So I'm I'm curious. Uh, any new developments with the John Deere tractor? Nope. Nothing. Have you been on it? Nope. It's still at the shop waiting for waiting for its wood chipper. So. Oh my! Well, they have to do special order it. Oh, yes. Everything. Just like everything in the world right now, you can't just buy anything. Everything's got to be ordered and it'll come in when it comes in and it'll cost what it costs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Well, you know, um, what what episode are we on? Is this 13? 13. Lucky 13. Yeah. Lucky 13. And, you know, um, I, probably one of the things that excites me most, every one of our shows is different. I love it. There's no... I mean, there's a little bit of regularity, like the songs and, uh, you know, the, some of the music, some of the, the the borders of our show. But as far as guests and topics, and we keep changing it up. And people love that. People uh, people are loving the variety. And, and uh, I I will tell you before we bring on our, our guest for today that, that I historically... I'm not an old English guy, but um, we have uh, a guest coming on who is, uh, he's an old English fella. And um, anyways, we're supposed to do small talk now, but let's jump in. Anything we want to talk about before we jump into the breed of the week? Nope. I say, let's go for it. Sweet. All right, let's do it. All right, now tell us about Neil. Yeah. Yeah. So let me introduce to you folks. And um, Neil Mahaffey is a, uh, he is a, he's a Southern boy from North Carolina. And uh, I didn't even tell him this when we were backstage, but I love to just sit and listen to Neil talk. You know, it's like uh, he was saying how he was, he was tickled to be on the show. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, Neil Mahaffey lives uh, down in North Carolina. I don't know your ex exact city, but he's near Salisbury. Is that right, Neil? Are you in Salisbury? No, I'm actually in Lexington. I'm about 10 miles north of Salisbury. Okay. Okay. And uh, so this is Neil Mahaffey. And Neil is, um, there's a breed of chickens for all of you newbies. There's a breed of chickens called Old English Game. Now, just to clarify, there's also another breed called the American game. So you have old English game and you have American game and there's bantams and there's large fowl in, in both of those two, two breeds. So All right, we're gonna, what, about, what about the moderns? Well, modern games, <laughs> yeah, they're hopeful. Well, you're right. It, you know, some of our newbies might not even know that, but the modern games are another type of game that are, totally different but the american game and the old english game they're a little bit similar in the way they look and uh and some of their structure um so um neil let's jump in uh you live one of the things I, I wrote down a bunch of things for us to talk about but one of the things well first tell us um tell us about old english why you like them, kind of your history and how you got involved in them, and uh, why are they such a big deal to you? Well, the, the, the one of the biggest things about Old English is they're so readily available in the South. The South seems to be, back when I first started fooling with birds, uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, the Old English were the biggest classes, you know, a lot of competition, and, and that's what really got me the most inter interested in it and the size, you know, you can raise these birds, uh, in a, a modest, you know, 
setting you don't have to have a whole lot of space unless you just raise a you know a great amount of them but they don't require a lot of space you know modest feed consumption so it's a it's a good it was a good bird for a teenager to fool with uh, back then uh and, and like i said the competition part was definitely a, a thrill for me you know it was, it was it was a big deal it was a big deal yeah 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 so there are there are a lot of colors of old english it seems like every time i blink my eyes we judges have to learn a new color so uh talk a little bit about um this color development and just um some of the different varieties you know we've, we've added about four colors in the last three years and you know it's neat you'll have groups of people that'll start working on a specific color variation and I know years ago, blue quail was a color that had, a lot of people were fooling with, but they never put the time to get a qualifying meat and, you know, get them in the standard. And they were some really good birds that you hated at the end of the day, didn't get a chance to go on champion row because they weren't a recognized color. And so I've always encouraged folks to, you know, to have a group of you working together because, you know, it's hard to do something standalone, especially when you're making colors that, you know, you, you need others working on that so you have breed birds that you can trade back and forth and and work on trying to to get them where you want them but uh it, it seems to be more prevalent now than it was years ago you know used to back in the uh, 70s and 80s you know you you didn't have a whole lot of, of some of the colors you know variations like blue wheaton is, is big now that used to not used to be seen that that's much. one of my favorites lemon blue i mean there's th yeah. those birds have come so far in the last 15 20 years and it's just the yeah. dedication of the people that breeds them you know, yeah. you got a group together that, that, that will trade, you know, people used to say, well, why are BBs and blacks? Why are there, you know, there are so many of those and they're, they're, they're so much better a lot of times. Well, look how many people raise them. When you've got a breed pool to pull out of, you know, I may go to you to get a bird to help me with leg color, or eye color, or whatever. Well, the more people that raise them, the, the better chance I've got of getting something that's going to help me improve and go in the right direction. So yeah, some of the yeah. lesser colors have just gained popularity. You know, they're striking in color and, you know, people are, are, are working together on them and they're, and they're making yeah. them better. Yeah. Well, uh, we may have jumped ahead a little bit, Neil. So let's back up. Um, what do you know, history wise? I mean, old English, I, I can't remember in the standard. They, they've been around a long time, buddy. Yeah, they've been around a long time. I don't know exactly how long, but they have they have been around probably one of the older breeds out there, probably. I'm looking at the uh, the standard from the American Bantam Association. It says their origin was in England, which you probably knew that. Right. And they were first recognized in the British standard in 1865. We didn't even have a standard in America back then. <laughs> or it was, you know, and... Uh, and it's interesting in the American Bantam Association standard, it says American status, the most popular breed. There, so, there's a couple more colors in the ABA standard. Let's put them up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many? What's that say? 41? 41. That's oh, the my most gracious. recent that I saw. Who knows what they've added since then? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's current. I think that that's is a good figure. Yeah, okay. So, Neil, the purpose of an old English bantam, and maybe this is a chance in our show because we don't talk about this much. It's safe to say, and, and Neil, you jump in and, and add to this, but I think it's safe to say that breeding bantam chickens in America, well, I'd say globally, is really for hobby. I mean... We don't, we're not eating those chickens and we're not producing them for egg flocks. There's just strictly hobby. Am, am I, is you're, that what you're, you would say? Yeah, that, I would say that's a good statement. Like I said, they're, they're pretty much strictly for exhibition only. Yeah. 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 And some of the and, other, you know, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, that, you know, some of the other bantam breeds, you know, smaller breeds, you know, fall into the same category, you know, as far as just being exhibition. Like you see, right, in your modern games, you know, the smaller, smaller breeds, uh, especially yeah. strictly for exhibition. Yeah. Well, and the reality is, I mean, you said in backstage before we came on, you have around 270 birds at your place. And if those are all bantams, I mean, your feed bill is, I mean, I'm, it's, not 
it's pretty minimal, right? I mean, obviously you spend some money feeding that many birds, but if I had 270 large fowl compared to Bantams, oh, your yeah. feed it bill would, would vary. Oh, it would be a whole lot more in the, the space needed to adequately raise those birds off for exhibition would, would substantially be a lot bigger. Yeah. You know, because like I said, you've got to have you've got to have the adequate space when the birds are finishing out to to have them in, you know, an optimum feather, and it just a yeah. lot goes into that. You know, I tell people you don't you don't win a show on Saturday by picking a bird on Thursday out of the yard. Yeah. You work on that about six months prior, conditioning, feeding, you know, things that, that you have to do to get them in the in in optimum shape because the the competition is just so so keen. Uh, not saying it's not in other breeds, but. You know, it is really keen in the in the old English class, especially yeah. in, in the South. And it has been ever since I've been involved in it. Yeah, yeah. So you, um, let's talk a little bit more about your breeding program. And and you said you have both Bantam and large fowl at your place, correct? I do, I do. And I've only had the large fowl for about 10 years, but I've had the Bantams probably 40 years, probably. Wow, cool, cool. So let's talk Bantams for a few minutes. Um, what are your top three favorite colors in the Bantams? And oh, maybe God. connected. I'm assuming they're they're, they're one, the colors that you have, right? Well, the the blues are always my favorite. Uh, I've okay. always liked the blues. Uh, the blacks. I've always liked blacks as well. And you know, the party color birds. I have a lot of respect for them. Wheaton, I guess, would be my my next my next favorite of the of the three. I I've raised all three at one time or the other. But like I said, the blues are always something. As long as I can carry a feed bucket i'll have blue old english on the place that's great that's great and and these these colors you currently have well i've got just blacks and and the blues and splash which you know any any blue color those three three color offspring so right. basically if you raise anything blue you're going to get you know blues blacks or splash in my in my case with the raising the blues but yeah. in any yeah. in any blue variety you actually are full of three different three different colors out of the, out of that mating, you know, like the lemon yeah. blue, or the blue red. So you, you've got to kind of account for that. Everything you're going to get is not going to be blue, you know? Right. Right. So let's talk, you know, our show is called responsible chicken breeding. So share a little bit of, uh, you know, when you're, I mean, how many blues, which will include blacks and splashes, how many of those will you hatch out a year? Uh, I usually try to hatch around 100 to 150. It just okay. depends. I've I've cut way back in in the last several years. I used to raise six or seven hundred, but I've I've got more selective and keeping less birds to breed out of. You know, uh, which is better. You know, instead of qu quantity quality, uh, I don't sell a whole lot of birds. I, I usually give away more to kids than I than I sell nowadays. But I used to raise quite a few more. You know, but but you know the trying to I, I line breed you know i don't bring a lot of birds in occasionally i'll bring a bird in but i usually blind breed with what i have here and and have for years and and like i said if you do that in toe punch and keep up with where your offspring come from when you go to breeding back you know it makes a big difference cutting down on cold birds you raise and uh you know you, you can see improvement in certain areas and if you've got everything you've got your records good you know you can kind of kind of cut back on breeding pens later on down the line that's that's the goal raise raise better with less yeah well, and that yeah, you, have and, to, you have to give people some hope if you have a line of birds for 40 years i don't think well, you I'm should have saying, to raise a thousand birds for each variety well, well, <laughs> anymore no, I mean, yeah I, yeah that's that's the whole key to it i mean yeah. i used to have 15 different colors so you know you raise 100 of each color and you can get crazy quick but with with this you know uh I try to, you know, you, this year I had four blue pins and 10 black pins set up. So, you know, and they're all family related, you know, but I'm not saying I hadn't brought birds in over 40 years because I definitely yeah. have. <laughs> right, it's, right. Know, it's not, not, not a lot. Yeah. So Neil, you know, we talk in any time we're discussing breeds of chickens, we talk, we talk about selection and I'm just curious. So, you know, you know as well as I do, and you probably know it better than I do when we talk about old English, that that body is everything. Before we, you know, we got to build the barn before we paint it. We're on the same page, right? Right, definitely. So, so when you're selecting, as your blues and blacks and splashes are growing out, um, over all these years, 
How are you, you know, give us a little secret on when Neil's looking at a pen of birds. What are you seeing that catches your eye throughout that growing stage? And what are you watching for specifically with body and, and maybe vigor? What do you, what would you well, say to you that? Can, you know, after you, after you've handled, handled a lot, you can kind of feel that frame, even though if it's not filled out, you can feel that frame did wide front several years back, probably 10 or 15 years back, the old English started getting a lot of extra feather. Uh, it, they just seem to be heavier feather. And I, you can probably attest to that Jim from the last, 15 to 20 years. And I think a lot of that extra feathering has caused a lot of wing issues more than anything, you know, more wing length, but that body, I mean, uh, I know uh, Warren Bill told me years ago, I can judge, I can walk down through and feel those birds. And I can tell if they're an old English before I even look at them by feeling them. And so you want to make sure you've got that good wide front, wide frame, and you want, want them to carry their width all the way through their back. If you get birds that start getting narrow in the back, then you start having egg production issues, small eggs, things of that nature. You want that bird to be wide in the front and carry the width all the way through to the back, which is, you know, as they as they grow, I tell folks, you know, I go out there and look at them today and I've got a blue cockerel I really like. And I go out there a week later and I can't find him. You know, they change so quick this time of the year, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but you you can you can just feel that frame. You want to have that good softball round body feel even if they hadn't totally developed yet, you, you can tell that versus a narrow body bird. Yeah. And, and we talk a lot about vigor, you know, when we talk big chickens like Orpingtons and Rhode Island reds, you got to really pay attention to vigor, but do you ever see an old English that doesn't have vigor? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Some <laughs> have more than others, but uh, I've never seen any that, that didn't have any. And that's one of the, one of the things too, the aggression, you need to back the aggression down on them, you know, so you can handle them and the judges can handle them. Uh, and I think the size now is a little less than what it used to be years ago. You know, the, the, the cock birds, a 24 ounce bird, uh, hen and cockle are, are uh, 22 ounces and the pullets are 20 ounces. Well, I dare say there's many 20 ounce pullets out there, you know, but they're, you know, it's just over the years, it's kind of the, the size has been bred down a little bit. Uh, our northern counterparts are better at that than we are. Their their birds are are corkier. What I like to say, corky. They got good hard bodies, good tight wings. And I think part of the part of that's come from the feathering. You know, going for a little extra feather. That's caused the birds to be a little softer. They're really not yeah. as hard a lot of times yeah. as they need to be. And, and and I actually I wanted to go down that trail when we talk about poultry the poultry shows and but this is a good segue just with that statement you just made. Old English in the north, Old English in the south. What's the difference? And maybe you just you just mentioned it. And and how did that happen? You know, I don't really know. Uh, I know down here in the south, you know, the heavy feathered birds seem to be winning a little bit more. And I don't know if people just kind of gravitated towards towards that. But the uh, the, the when you say up, heavy feathered, you're talking. Loose feather too, right? A little lo looser, a little more cushion, heavier cushion, a little more tail length and width, uh, even. Uh, and like I said, sometimes it's it's exaggerated enough that you can you know you can pick it. Looks like a rose comb. I mean, there's just way too much. Then our new some of our New England counterparts. I know Ben Bensinger was a good friend of mine years ago from Pennsylvania. He was big on those good hard bodies, good tight wings up. You know, wings pulled up good. Uh, he had awesome birds and was a was a great breeder. And and his birds come to mind uh, a lot of times when you think about a good corky, hard bodied bird, tight feathered bird, hard feathered bird. Uh, it just seemed like we had kind of gotten away from him. We're kind of getting back on on track, but there's still some birds that are a little a little heavier feathered. Wing carriage is is, is a biggie. I think that, that that falls in with that too. It seems like the the heavier feathered birds seem to have a little bit droopier, weaker wing than those corkier bodied birds do. So uh, that's, a, and that's a biggie. That's a biggie in a breeding pen. That's that yeah. wing, wing carriage is, is a tough thing to, to keep. Yeah. 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 So, so that's awesome. That's such helpful information. So talk large fowl. What color large fowl do you have? Uh, blues, blacks, and splash. And those are what? <laughs> Go oh, figure. I should have. <laughs> Go figure. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. And, and how many of those will you raise out a year? Uh, usually around 50 to 70, uh, somewhere in that range. That's, you have to single those birds a whole lot quicker. Uh, they're bad to pick, uh, 
that you've got them bruised heavily, they start growing off, they get to picking worse. And this is kind of just the growing thing that I've kind of learned over the years because we don't have any large fowl game guys around my area. They're they're more of a New England group. There's a larger group of, of the big game guys that from that area. And, and uh, so I'm kind of learning as I go, you know, kind of trial and error, kind of deal with some other things. But it just takes more room. But I, I don't try to raise quite as many of those. Yeah. They're more and same fun thing. Same with selection, right? You're watching for the same exactly. things in the big boys you see in the little boys. Exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. I just don't know them as well. Uh, I can't. I'm having. I'm finding where I'm having to house them longer to find what I want. You know, I've got to let them mature further down the road to know if they're going to be what I want versus the old English bantams. I can look at. I can call those pretty pretty early. Yeah. And it's just yeah. in the years of fooling with them. You know, it's like anything else. <laughs> Is do you do you do anything with the slash? Like those aren't showable, are they? Well, they're all recognized. The, okay. The are. are recognized, but they're mainly, I usually just for breeding purposes. You know, if you breed blue to blue, you get 50% blue, you get 25% black and 25% splash, theoretically. Uh, so if you breed the splash over black, then you get 100% blue. Now, your ground color and variation will be, you know, can be different, but they'll all be blue. So basically, those birds and the blacks that you get out of those blues also like the splash, uh, if you breed them over splash, you'll get 100% blues. But like I said, you've got to deal with the with the color variation. But the, they're they're really really nice type a lot of times because they're kind of like a hybrid, you know, out of that blue to blue mating. And so they a lot of times have extremely good type and a lot of what you're really looking for. So they're they're very valuable in a breeding program. Hmm. Neil, um, historically, I think both. Well, probably started in Great Britain. I mean, the American game and even the old English game, historically, do both of their roots, and maybe I should have looked this up because you might not even know, do both of their roots go back to cockfighting? I, I don't know, but I would assume uh, the yeah. American game, you know, we they're, they're kind of making a comeback. I used to see some years ago back in the 80s, there was a few folks that had them, but I haven't seen a lot at the shows uh here late then we did actually have some back in march at our show first ones i'd seen in years at, actually in competition but they are they're more of a cockfighting size the standards are a little bit bigger the, than the, what the cockfighting bird but i would say the the american game look a lot like the old cockfighting birds in type yeah and i think i know there's i you know i live in southern west virginia i'm eight miles from the kentucky border and and there's you know, we got little lean to huts of old oh, English yeah. large file all over. And when Melissa and I lived in Old Fort, North Carolina, you know, we had a, a neighbor. He grew. I think they're they're illegal nationwide now to fight, though, aren't they? It is. It is. It is. There's a lot of people that fool with them. I mean, game chickens will get in your. Yeah, let's see. We lost you, Neil. Oh, you're you, back. Am, okay. am I back? Yeah, yeah, back. yeah, you're back. Got a call there, but uh, yeah. But anyhow, the uh, the the big games, you know, the cockfighting, even though that's illegal, there's still a lot of folks that just still fool with game chickens because they like game chickens. You know, oh. we have some down here too, the yeah. same way. Yeah, that's what was that's what was hard on me when I first started trying to raise some to show was getting birds to breed from because I was having trouble getting the right leg and eye color because in cockfighting that wasn't a, that wasn't a big deal, you know. So. <laughs> Yeah, now now historically too, um, they're to me they're a great a range bird. I mean they they're very active, so they're constantly scratching. Oh, yeah. And 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 the large fowl are yours broody? Yeah. Do they go broody? Yeah, they, they do. They do. Uh, not what about as much your bantams? The Will they go broody? But uh, but they do. Yeah. Will your bantams go broody? They do. They do. I usually, I usually don't set a whole lot, but they will. I mean, they'll lay 10 to 12 eggs a lot of times and, and go brood, especially the hens. The pullets are not as much so as the hens are, but the hens, they do brood fairly often. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know what color Old English eggs are. They're a, a pale white. Okay. Yeah, Probably about white all of them. Yeah. About all of them. Great question. Yeah. I was, all, like, yeah, I was embarrassed all by that. I was sitting here going, I don't even know what color egg. Yeah, all, the, all the varieties, same, same color egg. Yeah. Yeah. So Neil, here's a, a, uh, 
Largely discussed subject, and I think that we could help educate a lot of our listeners. The subject of dubbing. Talk now. I'll explain dubbing. So, all of you listeners, dubbing is when we actually all Old English, Bantam, Large Fowl, the American games, the modern games. They all have a single comb, and um, but we in the exhibition world and. And uh, we can clarify, Neil, if it's in the breeding world. But in the exhibition world, we actually dub the chicken. Uh, we dub the combs on uh, the the single comb. We cut it off. So, Neil, describe dubbing. What exactly is it? I kind of just gave a simple overview. What would you add to that? Right. Well, it's, it kind of distinguishes the breed as far as exhibition. You know, any bird shown after the november the first has to be dubbed and so it's just a process that you take to cut the comb off the earlobes and the wattles have to be trimmed you know trimmed smooth to the face smooth to the throat and it's just part of the breed i mean it's just you know part of part of and i think sometimes people don't really like that aspect of of that but it's just part of the breed and and like i said an old english male that's not trimmed is it's just a, uh, you know, you're kind of ugly. I don't even know how to describe it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's also know, a, I wonder, it's also a disqualification. I see it, it right here. It yeah. It <laughs> yeah. So, and, and Neil, I think historically, and again, I'm guessing, but I can't remember some of my old English conversations with some of the old timers is that it had to do with fighting. It's a, it's a tradition it in the sense that you're taking all that red attire off the face so that when, when, they're in the fighting ring, they're not going to be as bloody, right? That, that's true, as well as the other bird doesn't have something to get a hold of. Uh, with a comb or an earlobe or a waddle, you know, you've got this extra flesh that's easily available, you know, to get a hold of, you know, in, in a fight. So that's that's another big reason, you know, uh, that they were dubbed. And you old English breeders, I mean, that's a real art. When I'm judging, I see very poor dubbing jobs sometimes. I'm like, ooh, you made it look even worse. So explain. It's an art, isn't it? Learning that. It is. It is. And it's just it's just trial and error. I mean, it's it's a it's a tough thing to learn because you've only got, you know, depending on how many you raise, you know, if you only raise 30 or 40, you're not going to have a few to, to trim, you know. And I had a friend that had a lot of calls and he'd say, Hey, come over here. If you want to trim about 20 birds, come over here and practice on some of these males. And, oh, you know, I yeah. got pretty good at it down through the years. You know, sometimes you want somebody to hold the bird for you. Some people cut the comb from front to back. Some like to go from back to front. So there's various ways, you know, to do it, but it does, it does make the bird. I mean, like I said, a bad dub job can ruin a good chicken. So it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's one of those things where you don't want to dub your, when you first start dubbing your first birds in the fall, you don't want to dub your best ones first. You want to kind of get your get yeah. your groove back going before you start trimming the good ones. Now, one of the biggest questions along this subject, in your opinion, is it, I mean, there's obviously there's a level of pain for the bird, but if you do it right and the process is done right, I mean, birds are fine, correct? Yeah, I've, yeah, I've very seldom had any fatalities from dubbing. You know, I always try to, I don't like doing it on a hot day or a real humid day. And I also like to do it late in the day where the bird's not going to be as active. If you do it an hour or so before dark, make sure they clot well, they go to roost. Next morning, they're scabbed over and, you know, everything's good to go. But I mean, I'm sure it's uncomfortable during the time. I know I've, I've, some people have told me they would give vitamin K a week or so uh, ahead of time in the feed to help with the clotting process. There's clotting agents out here that you can use on the on the wound to help that clotting happen. But most of the time I trim one, I'll stick their head down in a cold bucket of water and put them in a scratch pen, kind of spread them out where they're not close enough to want to, you know, shuffle around each other. A few hours they're I mean, they're, they're eating and good to go. Uh, like I said, I'm sure they're sore, you know, uh, after that, after they scab over for a while. And you, you will have some lose a little weight. You can tell for the first week or two, but, uh, but normally it's not a, it's not a, it's not a bad process. So if you don't like blood and you don't like dubbing, you probably ought to not be breeding and wanting to exhibit old English. 
It, well, if you're going to show males, uh, definitely not, because like I said, those birds have to be have to be trimmed to be shown. Uh, so that's that's one part of the of the breed that you know sometimes with some of the kids coming along you know it's kind of hard to it's kind of a hard sell for for some of those you know but you know it's it's part of the breed and I hope it continues to be I know there's a lot of folks that aren't really fond of it but I I hope it stays around because I I really do feel like that's part of the heritage of the breed. I agree. I agree. I agree. Um... Karen, on the breeding side, before we jump into the judging side, uh, any other questions you can think of that? I'd like you all to go over your pictures. Okay. So, so Neil, talk a little bit about these birds. I'm assuming uh, these came from came from you, and uh, are these winners? Are they those your are, birds? Those talk are a couple those. pictures. No. No, those are a couple of birds that I, I pulled those pictures. The, the male bird is is a Kyle Tripp bird from Arizona. And oh, I cool. really like this bird's type. Uh, I like his tail carriage, uh, feather width, I like where his chest is, his wings are. He is, in my opinion, a really good specimen of a, of a male Old English. And the female is a Bill Wolf bird uh, from Indiana. That's a Bill Wolf female. And she's wings up good, tail spread, good front, out in front of her. Uh, those are, I feel like, are good good specimens of, of, of Old English. Now, I am noticing on Kyle's bird, you don't got this big old massive rose comb spread on that tail, my friend. He's got some feather. He's got some feather. But he's tight. Yeah. No, I. but it, it doesn't seem as spread. It doesn't seem overdone. It seems balanced. Right, right. Right, the moderate, moderately spread. Yeah, that's and that's what I like about that bird. A lot of the birds, you know, if they're in a fighting mode, or they'll be overly spread, and and that's just a good relaxed profile of of a good old English male. I mean, he's he's got good tail, uh, good tail length, good coverage. Everything is laying where it should. He's just a really nice bird, I think. Yeah, that's awesome. What other pictures, Karen? All right, we've got a blue Wheaton, which I guess there's blue in there somewhere. Oh yeah, it's yeah the, the tail, the tail, the tail <laughs> yeah. and the wings. But that Whose bird that was that Neil? Is a, is a Steve, that's a Steve Ledford bird in Georgia, the blue Wheaton. She's a he's got some real nice. He's one of the guys that's really put a lot of time into some of these off colors over the years, and he's reaping the rewards from it. And I'd like for you to handle that bird, uh, feel the body on that bird, okay. and the little blue female is a little pullet I raised last year. That's a little female I raised last year. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot that. I think, I mean, you know, when you're judging, you don't always know all the guys' names, but I, I know Steve's, he, he's the one that's known for the blue Wheatons, huh? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And those are some BB reds. I, that, I think that first picture was from our, uh, was a winner of our old English class at the uniform show. That was a Keith Proctor. Uh, male and then the bird the other bird is is on the ground that's a david hager that's a member of our club it's been a member for years and keith is as well but i was down at david's and we were looking at some birds and we had some snapshots i thought that picture of that bb male out in the outside light really showed off the the green sheen in his tail oh, and, the, and the real good balance and party color. yeah 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 Love the green those sheen. Are real, Beautiful. Those, those BB reds are real, real eye catcher. They really are. They are. Yeah. 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 All right. I say let's end this and move on to the other. So cool. We'll keep going. We got lots more to come. Check this out. Here we go. Neil, right. did you see that that picture of me? That was me uh, handling an, uh, a really good BB red female, I think, at that Northern Georgia show in Jefferson years ago. Uh, I saw that. I saw that. You look like you were enjoying yourself, too. <laughs> you know, when you think about judging Old English, and this is what we call this section, I will tell all of you listeners that, that um, you know, I started, I grew up, 
my teenage years was in the Pacific Northwest and Oregon and Washington. And, and we didn't hear a lot of, I mean, there were old English. You might remember actually, Neil, you remember an old guy named Art Rice from Seattle, Washington, from Washington state. He, he actually, he actually showed with us at the Jamboree. Art Rice was a fine BB red man. He was oh, a good man. Fine, fine. And so, you know, that was really my only old English exposure. And he won everything, so no one else really bred old English. So to be quite frank with all of you and, and, and you listeners, is there's still probably a ton that I could learn from Neil about about judging old English. But um Neil, talk a little bit about um you know the the Bantam the, well, let me say this. And so as I I remember uh, first time I after I got my license, I was judging a large old English class uh, might have been in um, might have been in Fresno, California. And it was uh, they they have a large showing of old English at that show yeah. years and years and years ago. But I remember I'm like, I don't know about this, but, you know, you study the book, you look at the you study the book, look at the birds, study the book, look at the birds. And you also learn from, you know, other judges. And uh, but I always I always remember when it comes to Old English, you know, when you get the poultry press and you'd read about chicken shows across America, you always had large Old English entries, bantams, not large fowl, in the South. Um and uh, I mean, I tell everybody when I'm judging, you know, when I judge at Dalton, Georgia, you'll have, you might have um, 800 chickens or man, let's just say it's a 1500 bird show and 1200 of them will be old English. That's not a stretch of imagination, is it, buddy? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, the Southern Southern has been the hotbed for old English for years and years. And like you said, that Dalton show, the Anderson show, our show in, in Salisbury, the Jamboree has always drawn a lot of, a lot of old English. Uh, yeah. It's just, I don't I, like it's all ever since I've been in, it's been that way. Yeah. So listeners, there's a, there's a chicken show, a poultry show called the old English uh, Jamboree. And it's held the first Saturday in November. And Neil, you said that it started in 1965, correct? That's correct. It started in 1965 in Concord, North Carolina. And uh, it was there for many number of years. Then it moved to Hickory, uh, North Carolina. I don't know exactly the date, but it, it's, it stayed in Hickory for a long time. And in 2002, we moved the show to Salisbury, North Carolina. So we've had, we've had three homes uh, since, since 65. And you've been involved with the Jamboree since, what'd you say, 1978? I've, well, I've, I've been, the, the Jamboree, I have run it for right at 20 years now. Uh, wow. I was still involved in Hickory, you know, helping set up and tear down. Uh, at that time, Warren Beal, I know you remember Warren, Mr. Warren, oh, he, yeah. he ran things for years and years and years. He was a great judge and a great man and a great friend of the old English game, Bantam, for sure. And he ran the show for many years. And, and when he stepped down, Johnny Flowers took over. And then when Johnny uh, stepped down, I, I took it from them. So I, I tell people it's kind of like a family heirloom, you know, taking this thing <laughs> and keeping it going. Uh, you know, those guys put a lot of work, guys and gals, uh, put a lot of work into this. And we're just trying to do our best to keep it going uh, as long yeah. as we're here. Yeah, you know, I got my uh, my judging license in 1994. And, you know, we, we go through this clerking process where we have to hang with judges. And Warren Beale, um, I'm trying to remember where it was. I think it was at a poultry show up in Maumee, Ohio. They used to have a chicken show up there called the Great Lakes Poultry Show. And Warren, I lived in Michigan at the time, and Warren Beale... I clerked with him and I was just friendly, knowledgeable, had a wonderful Southern accent. He was a hoot. I'll never forget judging with him. Yeah, he was a, he was a good guy. I can remember the first time I went to Warren's house and Warren had a lot of different colors, you know, a lot of different varieties of old English on his place. And I remember going there in the, in the, 
early eighties with a good friend of mine, Ted Carter. And we rode up there to see Warren and they were just colors that I had never seen. And it just really expanded my love of the varieties, you know, cause a lot of stuff Warren had, a lot of people didn't have. And, and he did a lot for the, for the old Amos. He, I remember he once told me, he said, you know, if you're doing this, uh, you need a good mentor. Uh, you need a mentor, not only that raises the birds, but just, a uh, just somebody that will put you in the right direction. I know, uh, Will Burton was a good friend of mine. I know you yeah. remember him, Jim. He just, we just lost Will a few months ago, but I know he was kind of my mentor when I first started and Will didn't have old English and, but he helped me find folks that did. And he helped answer a lot of questions that I had as a young person. Uh, you know, uh, at that time I didn't, I didn't know. And, and, and Will was good enough to kind of take me under his wing and, and he let me go to some shows with him and, and taught me a lot, you know, from an ABA judges standpoint. Uh, yeah. That was really neat. And, and and Warren had always told me, he said, if you're doing this, everybody has needed help and everybody has gotten help. And so, you know, never forget where you came from and always try to help people. Awesome. And that was just how Warren was. And that's how a lot of our old English folks are. You know, they're willing to share birds with people. And that's that's a that's a great thing to do. You know, you know, look at this uh, Trevor guy here. He says, good talk, Mr. Neal. And thank you for what you do to make the Jamboree possible. One of the best, if not the best display of old English in the country. If you raise old English Bantams, this is the show to go to. <laughs> do you know him? I do. He's a good, he's a younger guy that's come on and he is enthused and, and great. He's a, he's the kind of folks that we love to be around. He's a, he's yeah. a very well thought of guy too. And yeah, you can so, tell he's making improvements every year. That's great. So Neil, while we're talking Jamboree, um, first Saturday in November, uh, how many, that's how many correct. birds do you normally have? Well, typically we have between six and 700, uh, used to years ago, we had, a lot more. Uh, uh, the avian flu uh, AI testing in the state uh, had gotten more stringent and kind of kind of hurt our numbers because we were kind of held to a standard. I mean, the, the, it was the overall MPIP plan, but the states could make it a little tougher. And since we were yeah. so high with poultry, you know, growers and fryers, they they made things a little a little tougher on us for a while. Nothing that we couldn't do, but a lot of the good fo folks coming from out of state either didn't have the means to get their birds tested within the window of time or didn't want to fool with it. Uh, and so that kind of hurt us. But as the playing field is kind of leveled on that testing, our numbers have kind of started slowly coming back. And I, I look for them to just keep climbing. I don't think, I think the days of 13, 1500 bird jamborees are, are a thing of the past. I don't think we'll see that again, but I do, I do see a resurgence in the, in the breed. Uh, and a lot of it is, you know, because of the health regulations. And the hell, I mean, the, the quality has been maintained though, hasn't it? Oh, I'm sorry, Jim, I didn't hear you. The quality has, has continued to, to, to remain, hasn't it? Even though the numbers it, are smaller. It has. it has, even though the numbers, the total numbers are smaller, it, it, the quality is still there. And it's, it's like the, it's like our Super Bowl, uh, you know, or Daytona 500 per se, uh, <laughs> you know, you want to, if you go there and do good, you know, that's the, that's, that's the pinnacle. And, it, and, it, and there's some other good game shows. I'm not saying there's not, and I, I, I want to mention some later on before we go off air, but, but our show has, has been around and we've fought through a lot of different things to try to, and it's, it, it, it just to our members, uh, that's where I give all the, uh, they've helped me. Like I said, I'm just one, one little part of it. And we've got folks that are passed on that have made this thing what it is. And, and like I said, we're just, our group's trying to keep it going. Yeah. Yeah. So talking, talking, judging of old English, um, tell me, uh, you know, and again, you're, it's, it's our show and it's just your opinion. This isn't the gospel truth, but who would you say in the South, probably the top, you know, four or five judges that all the breeders are like those that, you know, I'm sure they hound you when it comes to hiring judges, you got to get this one, this one, this one, or this one, right? Well, you know, years ago it, it was a uh, Ralph Sheriff's name used to come up an awful lot. Uh, Joey Gates, Rocky Huey, a lot of these guys 
were old English guys. I mean, they, they bred and raised old English. And we always, this goes back to the Warren days. You know, we always tried to, to get folks that we felt like were, were not only good, good people and good judges, but, but raised old English and had, had, you know, fooled with them a long time. We felt like they were, they were good judges. So as far as any, I don't get it as much as I used to, as far as, you know, what's the, you got to hire this guy. You need to hire this guy uh, as much as we used to have. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of good judges out there, and we we try to get a variety. We try to you know get them from Midwest and up north. You know we used to have a bigger pool to to pick from years ago. We've lost a lot of folks, and we don't have a lot coming on board. But we tried to mix it up. You know, get guys that weren't right here in your backyard because a lot of the local guys you see those guys every week anyway. And I think that kind of helped our, our show over the years. We'd pull Jim Salee in from the West Coast or Tracy Hill in from Texas or some of the other, Dwayne Ballard, some of the guys from Texas. And Mike Crawford, we used to use him from Ohio, you know, uh, uh, and a lot of these guys have passed or are not judging now. So, But we always tried to look at it that way. And we've always asked our exhibitors, you know, if there's folks that you want to see, you know, we'll consider it, you know, we'll yeah. put them in the hat and, and, and try to get them. Timmy Clanton's a good, he's a good old English he's judge another, too. Yep. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yep. He's an Alabama guy. Yeah, he's a he's a good old English judge. That's his only problem is he roots for Alabama. So, you know, he wears that Alabama. shirt. <laughs> well, you tr we, we try to, we've learned to overlook things uh, over the years. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, on the judging side, you were talking about how sometimes, you know, the birds in the north are different than the birds in the south. Um, how, obviously, you would say, oh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this gently. You just correct me if you need to. You don't want a bird that's overdone with feathers, correct? Correct. Well, I don't. I mean, and you, and, and you made a very good point because some of the judges, you know, when you get a judge from up north, they're going to want that corkier, harder, less feather, tighter wing bird than down here a lot of times. Uh, and, and I think that's that's more true to type and true to form of what they need to be. But, you know, sometimes if the judge, you know, picks a bird, that's heavier feathered, then you may have an exhibitor that's not maybe been around a long time. They say, man, I don't just don't have enough feather on my birds. I need to, yeah. And so you get a little of that. So, uh, I mean, you know, it, it should be more bred to standard, but sometimes it's, it's bred more to what's winning. If that yeah. makes sense, you know? Yeah. And I, I say to all of our listeners, all of our listeners, you breed to the standard. You breed to what the book says. And when a judge, when he's picking birds that he or she is picking something that's a little different than maybe what the standard says or what your mentor taught you, don't don't cave into, oh, you know, I mean, this is a this is a fact. All these old English guys, and this is from coast to coast, they learn and study us judges, and they're like. I know what Jim likes. I know what Jim doesn't like. I know what Warren Beale likes. I know what he doesn't like. Tim Clanton, Jim Salee. And so, and, and, but to me, that's not, those are kind of um, those exhibitors who they come and they go. And so stick, stay true to the breed. And, and uh, sometimes you, I mean, every breeder, and every exhibitor, Neil, they have their favorites, judges, and their least favorites. That's just reality, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And you'll have, you know, some judges like females better than males, you know, and, and size. I mean, it, it, everybody's a, pretty much on the same page, but there are little traits that, that people pick up on. But but you're definitely right. Stick to the stick to breeding these things like they are in the standard. Cause don't just jump on a fad or, or ride a wave or you know try to get these birds like they need to be. The size uh, they'll reproduce. They'll 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 stay with you over the years. And so that's that's a very 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 true statement. Yeah yeah yeah. There there. Um, can I interrupt ahead, with some general yep. questions? So you also run or you're also involved in a uh, all breed show. We are. We have uh, we have an all breed show. It's always the first Saturday in March, 
and it's for large fowl and bantams and bantam ducks. Uh, we have that. Uh, it's called the Unifor Show. Years ago, we there was actually two different clubs. There was a Unifor club uniform poultry breeders association and then the jamboree guys and they kind of they, they were some of the same members but they kind of operated separately two different groups and so they ended up merging in, in, into one group and agreed on calling it the old angus game bantam club of north carolina and we would have the jamboree we would all host the jamboree in november and then we would host the all breed show in March. And so it kind of doubled the forces of, you know, all the guys working against that, having two clubs close together. We all just kind of combined the forces, uh, manpower and equipment and things of that nature. And, and, and we've been doing that probably golly since the nineties, probably, I think that probably happened in the early nineties. And that shows in Salisbury as well. Correct. It's correct. Same location. It's the uh, Rowan County fairgrounds in Salisbury. Yes, sir. Both of them. Yeah. That's great. And cool. What? So many, I mean, you get people on both sides of this argument of there's too many poultry shows and there's not enough poultry shows, but it takes a whole lot of work to keep a poultry show going or get one started and keep it going. I mean. Oh yeah. It, it would be really a costly venture. Now, you know, a lot of the early shows kind of tagged in with the county fairs for equipment purposes more than anything, because the fairs, fair associations could afford the equipment. Uh, to where the, the small, you know, back our little breed clubs or our little state clubs had trouble raising enough money to, to buy enough of these cages. So that's why a lot of the a lot of the shows kind of tag into some of these fairgrounds. But, you know, over the years, all we own all of our equipment, but that's been a 40 years, 50 years in the making. You know, uh, we've had raffles and sold, you know, tickets to, to have money to buy new cages and things of that. And all clubs do this. But it is a lot of work. There's a lot of work involved, a lot of manpower setting up, tearing down. Uh, you just don't realize how much it really is uh, to, to really put on a big show. You go to some of these big events like the Ohio National or, you know, some, some of these really big shows where they have the ABA Nationals, Springfield, Massachusetts, out in California, California. Uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, it is such a mass undertaking. I mean, you, you, it's just a, it just takes a lot. Uh, and that's, that's what's happened to a lot of these smaller clubs. Some of the members will pass on and, and there's just not enough manpower there to do it. And so there's been a lot of the smaller clubs, you know, fold, fold, but we, we're lucky to keep, be one of the ones that's still hanging on. And we'll the try, other thing we'll you find, Karen, on. the other thing you find, Karen, is if people, their shows that are all scheduled – and, you know, and people have in the South, this is true. If you were like going to put a poultry show on the third weekend in November, oh, how dare you? Because there's, you know, that's the, um, that's the Anderson, South Carolina weekend. If you go the, you know, Thanksgiving weekend is Dalton, Georgia. So uh, these exhibitors have their, their routines on where they go. Now, when a, when a club folds, oftentimes, you'll see another club form and they'll jump in and grab that weekend. That's how it works. Doesn't it, Neil? That's exactly, that's exactly how it works. And once in a while, you know, folks will bid on a national, like a breed national and they'll change a date to accommodate the breed or whatever. And, and sometimes you'll have, but it works better. Like you said, people kind of know where they're going to go, what weekend they're going to go. Uh, and, and they kind of, they sketch that in. So it, it does make, there's only so many weekends in the fall. I mean, you know, you've only got so many in a certain area, that you're gonna get you're gonna have a show so well and it's i mean you you're you're making an effort to get your your fall ready it's not like you can just decide the weekend before oh hey i think i'll go to a show yeah. you know what i mean like it's that that's one yeah. thing that i used to question our our date being in november i like to show males well i once i get a bird finished i like to let them finish pretty much totally feather out before i trim them well then after i trim them i'm another five to six weeks for them to be healed so if i don't get birds hatched in january or february male line stuff then you know i'll have birds scarred at the first of november but that's you know we're always kind of like fishing we're all fishing in the same water we're all the same problem so who's going to adjust to that the most there's always a, a good male bird at the end of the day in october so you know uh, somebody you know you, you just have to kind of time your hatching and and, and dubbing and all that on, on on this breed especially well, and the other thing, Neil, the fact that you are, you're managing a couple of big shows and you're breeding your own birds, you're not doing, and you, you got to live a normal life. 
you're not hitting a ton of shows in fall and spring, are you? Not, not, not many, not, not as many as I used to, you know, getting older kind of slows you down too, but I used to bonsai, you know, three weekends a month, you know, years ago, but I, you know, I've got a few, it's like anywhere else. It's kind of like a social gathering to me now. I've got certain ones that, you know, I like to go up North and see some of those friends that I don't see, you know, on a weekly basis down here and the same way, try to, you know, try to go somewhere to Florida or out Midwest or somewhere. We're going to Shawnee to the, the old English nationals in Shawnee, Oklahoma, uh, in December and they got a man, they got a show hall out there to second to none. Uh, so I will go out there, you know, this, this fall, but I don't go as many as I used to. That's Shawnee's show. I've judged that before that place. That was it. It's, it's, it's a, a big, it's place. impressive. It is. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So, All right. um, what else, Karen? Any well, other thoughts? I would say let's let Neil, he wanted to talk about some other shows. So we're reaching the end here. So, you want to give a shout out to the? <laughs> yeah, I do. I, well, I want to get you know we've already kind of touched on our show here in North Carolina. We've got a Facebook page. Uh, if you'll you know let us know, we'll add you to that group. Uh, the Old English Game Bantam Club of America is our national club. Uh, they've also got a Facebook page. You can Google that and get on that, and we'd love to have you look at some of that stuff. And if you're into Old English, uh, the our show in November, the the Anderson Group, they're doing an all game show. Uh, in January, I think it is now in South Carolina, uh, Texas all game guys. Uh, they have one in October, I think it is. Uh, and all those, all these groups are, are great, great groups promoting this breed. Uh, not that we don't like other stuff, but if you come to Jamboree, you better be ready to talk old English. <laughs> if, and if, if, and if you're coming to see any other breeds, you're coming on the wrong weekend. <laughs> you're picking the wrong weekend. That's a fact. If, if somebody was new to Old English, would they? Would you recommend they start at an all breed show first before they start showing up at a? Specific? Well, well, not necessarily. I mean, one thing about coming to our show, we've all got the same interest, the same bird, you know. But uh, any anywhere they go to a show and there's an Old English exhibitor there, you know, don't don't hesitate to talk to them because you know we're all trying to recruit and and know learn something all the time. I still learn every show I go to. I still learn something from somebody. Uh, I, I used to years ago, uh, Will Burton told me, he said, now Ralph Sheriff and, and Jack Yoder and some of those guys would be talking and I'd be, I was like a 14 or 15 year old kid and I'd just kind of ease in there, you know, and he said, well, just ease up there and listen. Cause if you start talking, they'll quit talking. And so I'd ease in there and listen to those guys and, and everybody's wanting to help. So I, I don't, I think it would be a good experience, be it our show or any other show. If you're interested in old English, there's plenty of folks out here that would be more willing to help. Well, uh, but Karen, I would tell you that the old English Jamboree, as long as I've been in poultry has been the granddaddy of them all when it comes to old English. I mean, like Neil said, we, uh, you know, the, the testing affected them, but, but there were people in the Pacific Northwest who would be like, we're flying out to the Old English Jamboree in Hickory, North Carolina, where they'd have 2,000, just, just Old English. These people are crazy. They are Old English addicts, man. And uh, they're still like that. It's just on a smaller number. But the Jamboree is the... That's the granddaddy of all the old English shows. Neil wouldn't say that, but that's probably true. <laughs> so, well, yeah. I, I, we, we put a lot of time into that thing. I, I, I think more of that show than about anywhere I go. And a lot of it's from the past folks, you know, the Warren Bills yeah. and the Johnny Flowers. Well, Neil, there's two things that come to my mind. Um, number one, I'll buy your place often, man. I need to stop in. I would love to. Just fellowship and yeah. see your birds, and that would be all, all you got to do is let me know when. I'll make. I know, answer. I know. The other thing is, um, I had two thoughts. Where'd the other one go? Oh, just um, just having you on here and being able to, uh, you know. Oh, I know what it was. To give your mentors credit. To me, my when I think of mentors. Uh, in the Northwest, on the West Coast, and even judges over the years. What I've learned from, you know, even from Warren Beale, um, Lewis Cunningham is, he's a good old, he's a pretty good old English man too, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, learned a lot oh, from yeah. him. A lot from him. And, uh, 
you know, we're I'm so glad that you are carrying on the the legacy because of, in a sense, what your mentors did for you and what you learned from them. And and I uh, I applaud that. And and I'm so glad that, you know, we're we're very indebted to our mentors. So that's a good thing. Very, very good thing. Anything else, Karen? No, I think we're good. Yeah, it's three o'clock straight up. We try to keep it right at about an hour. And Neil, uh, an absolute privilege for us to have you on the show and share this all over the old English pages. And we'll do some sharing. And uh, hopefully this will uh, this will be a very, very educational show for people to learn from. So, Neil, thanks a million, buddy. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Like I said, I hope anybody that's interested will, will get on one of those websites or follow up. We'll we'll be more than glad to have you uh, help you, and we'd love to have you in Salisbury the first week of November, <laughs> or the first weekend in March, or the first week in March. <laughs> Thank, right. awesome. Thank you. Awesome. We'll have you back. Thank y'all. See, See you next buddy. week. All right.